Welcome to our service for Sunday the 28th of March. We start our service with the hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. Let us pray. Our living Lord, we thank you that we can come before you with open and receptive hearts, recognising your many mercies to us, recognising the many gifts you have given us. You are Lord of all. Your word spoke the world into existence and you uphold it and sustain it by your wisdom and power. And we praise you for all the evidences of your renewing power 
that we see around us in this time of spring. We thank you for the coming of your Son amongst us and for the way he set his face faithfully to go in the path set out before him. Today on Palm Sunday we remember the rapturous welcome he was given as he entered Jerusalem and how he accepted the praise of the people. Yet we recognize too that he knew he had to tread the costly path to rejection and the cross to win our salvation. He took the way of the servant king in love for us and all the world. Lord, at times we feel unworthy of your love but we thank you that your grace and love extends to us regardless of our faults and failings. You welcome us with open arms, summoning us to walk in your way, the servant way, and leave behind our old self-centered ways. Forgive us our failings and renew us in your service that we might go forward with joy fixing our eyes upon Jesus, who has gone before us, and also journeys with us. You call us to receive your Spirit into our lives, receive your risen presence, and to make you our Lord, that we might go forward in your strength into the days that lie ahead. And so we would pray and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, reading verses 1 to 11 from the Good News Bible. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. There Jesus sent two of the disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied up with her colt beside her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything, tell him, the master needs them, and then he will let them go at once. This happened in order to make come true what the prophet had said. Tell the city of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and rides on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did what Jesus had told them to do. They brought the donkey and the colt, threw their cloaks over them, and Jesus got on. A large crowd of people spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the, on the road. The crowds walking in front of Jesus and those walking behind began to shout, Praise to David's son! God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord! Praise be to God! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he? the people asked. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, the crowds answered. And then turning to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 39 to 53, where we take up the story after the Last Supper. Jesus left the city and went, as he usually did, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples went with him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. 
Then he went off from them about the distance of a stone's throw, and knelt down and prayed. Father, he said, if you will, take this cup of suffering away from me. Not my will, however, but your will be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. In great anguish he prayed even more fervently. His sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Rising from his prayer, he went back to the disciples and found them asleep, worn out by their grief. He said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you will not fall into temptation. Jesus was still speaking when a crowd arrived, led by Judas, one of the twelve disciples. He came up to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said, Judas, is it with a kiss that you betray the Son of Man? When the disciples who were with Jesus saw what was going to happen, they asked, Shall we use our swords, Lord? And one of them struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, Enough of this! He touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come there to get him, Did you have to come with swords and clubs as though I were an outlaw? I was with you in the temple every day, and you did not try to arrest me. But this is your hour to act when the power of darkness rules. East of Jerusalem, there is a road that leads into the city from Bethany and Bethphage. From Bethany it winds steeply down, across a valley, then up and through the old city walls. On either side of it are the remnants of olive plantations with thick, gnarled trees that look old enough to have stood there in Jesus' time. 
It was a scene both of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on a donkey and the dreadful events of his arrest several days later. Bethany itself is less than two miles from Jerusalem and the hill on which it stands is called the Mount of Olives. It was a memorable day when Jesus rode on a donkey down the Mount of Olives towards Jerusalem a week before he died. Vast crowds had gathered for the Passover celebrations, and when they heard that this famous young teacher was coming towards Jerusalem, they surged out of the city to welcome him, excitedly joining with the large crowd of his disciples and other followers and hangers-on that was sweeping down the road. As he rode along, people spread their cloaks on the road in front of him. A person's cloak was one of their most valued possessions. It was their blanket by night, their protection by day, and a means of carrying loads. But people willingly laid them down in the dust before Jesus, as a way of declaring their allegiance to him, as a fitting way of honouring him but more than that, as a way of declaring him their king. Red carpet treatment was reserved for royalty or for those they desired to rule over them. And so they began to shout out, Praise to David's son. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Or as the New International Version has it, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna has an original literal meaning of save us. They wanted Jesus to be their king. But the trouble was that they wanted him to be a different kind of king than he had come to be. They were longing for the time when their Jewish nation would be great again. And they saw in Jesus a godly new leader the Messiah sent by God, who could lead them to victory over the Romans, and one who could take the place of their corrupt leaders. They were throwing down the gauntlet to him, and challenging him to be the one they wanted him to be. They were wanting him to dance to their tune. They were trying to hijack him to their own agenda and saying that if he would be their leader, they would follow him through thick and thin. But they wanted an earthly political and spiritual leader, and they were prepared, if need be, to go the way of the sword. If only they'd noticed that he rode not on a proud war horse, but on a donkey, and on a donkey's colt. Perhaps the colt was following its mother to emphasize that Jesus came in gentleness to gather up the weak and vulnerable. So Jesus rode down the Mount of Olives and up into Jerusalem with their praises and challenges ringing in his ears. Matthew tells us that when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Jesus went into the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and chased out those who were buying and selling there. He was filled with righteous anger at the way God's house was being desecrated. The next week was a busy one for him. He taught every day in the temple and large numbers of people gathered round to hear what he had to say. Many hung on his every word. Perhaps many others began to doubt whether he was really the king they were looking for. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law felt very threatened by all that he said and the parables that he told against them. They looked for way, a way to arrest him. But they were afraid to do so because of the high regard the people had for him. We read at the end of Luke 21 that when evening came, he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives. 
and then early the next morning all the people went to the temple to listen to him. Then back each night to the Mount of Olives. Why did he leave the city every night? There may be various reasons. At Passover time Jerusalem was bursting at the seams and there was possibly no accommodation available for them in the city. He also probably considered the danger of being arrested under the cover of night to be far greater in the city. The other Gospels help us build a fuller picture of his movements. Mark's Gospel speaks of him going out to Bethany at the end of the day with his twelve disciples. Now Bethany was on the Mount of Olives, so there's no conflict there. Two days before the Passover, he was invited to spend the evening at the house of Simon the leper in Bethany. And while there, a woman poured expensive perfume over his head. This may have been prompted by the occasion when Mary anointed his feet with perfume six days before the Passover, at the party he had attended at Lazarus's house to celebrate Lazarus's rising from the dead. He had friends in Bethany. But it seems as if he and his disciples normally spent at least part of the nights in lonely vigil on the mountainside. Perhaps they snatched a few hours here and there for sleep, wrapping their cloaks around them and curling up on the ground. Because in our reading today, we hear how they left the city and went out to the Mount of Olives as they usually did. And then when they arrived at the place, he went off from them about a stone's throw and knelt down to pray. There was a place that they had been in the habit of going to, and one to which Judas was able to guide the officers of the temple guard, because he had been there before. Matthew and Mark call the place Gethsemane, which means in Aramaic, oil press. Maybe at one time there had been an oil press among the olive trees there. John tells us it was a garden place of quiet and solitude. How important it was for Jesus at this time to have a place of quiet and solitude. The crowds had been trying to lead him along and make him bow to their demands. He needed strength from God to go the way for which he'd come. His days were filled with endless giving out as he taught in the temple. He needed to take in and be nourished by God, immerse himself in the presence of his heavenly Father, so that what he taught was God's truth and not man's wisdom, so that he might see clearly the path which he should take. And his Father confirmed to him that the way ahead was not the way of the sword, but the way of the Lord. He was not to try and protect himself and save his own skin, but rather yield himself to his enemies and allow things to go on to their terrible climax. That might seem the way of defeat, but God would work things out so that it was a victory more far-reaching than any he could achieve by taking up the sword and leading the people in armed rebellion against the Romans. So here we have Jesus in two very different situations at the Mount of Olives. By day with the crowds swarming around him as he entered Jerusalem, and by night drawing apart from the busyness and constant demands upon him and seeking God in the solitude. We all need such times of solitude and seeking God if we're to walk the best path through life, the way that God would desire us to go. There will always be crowds trying to lead us along and make us fit in with them. 
it takes courage to stand against the crowd and be faithful to God when there are voices all around us trying to pull us their way. Going God's way may demand sacrifices of us. Jesus never said it would be easy. But in the end, it will lead to victory and God will vindicate and bless us for our faithfulness. In the world today, there are many who have the choice of reaching for weapons or seeking a plan that will bring peace. Do we seek to retaliate to what we see as attacks on us? Or do we seek to defuse the situation and build bridges of understanding between us and those who have hurt or offended us? Do we go on the offensive to make sure we get our way? Or do we seek peace with those we see as our opponents? We all need places of solitude where we can meet with God and find His will. Or we will find ourselves just drifting along on the surface of life, going with the crowd. Sometimes Christians can be keen to rush past Good Friday to reach Easter Sunday and all that it promises of new life and resurrection. But the way to Easter Sunday led through Good Friday, and those who walk with Christ will often have to walk through their own Gethsemanes and on the way of the cross before they taste of resurrection life. Sometimes they will have to taste suffering, anguish and rejection along the way, as Christ himself did. But we who follow Christ have him with us on that way. And we can be sure that his way will lead in the fullness of time to resurrection life and that our lives are safe with him. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you that you freely took the path that led to the cross for our sake and our salvation. You did not try and compromise and take the easy path and let the world squeeze you into its mould. 
but you steadfastly set your face on a path that led you into conflict with the dark forces reigning in this world. And we praise you that when they thought they had defeated you, you rose victorious to open up a way for us all out of darkness into light, out of defeat into victory. May we embrace you as Lord, so that we may receive the fruits of your victory in our own lives. Help us to make space for you in our lives, to encounter you as our Saviour and Friend. We pray that your transforming love might do a work in all our lives and that throughout the world your kingdom might be built, a kingdom where all might dwell together in unity and love, set free from anxieties and fears, untroubled by violence and oppression. You seek to break down the barriers that divide us from one another. Your love reaches to all of us despite our differences, despite our individual faults and failings. Help us to be open to others, to love and respect them even if they are very different from us. We all have a place in your Father heart. Each of us is precious to you. We pray for all working to overcome the effects of the coronavirus, to protect us and to deal with all the negative repercussions arising from it. We pray for a smooth rollout of vaccination throughout the world to help defeat it and allow us once again more freely to interact face to face with people, to share friendship and experiences together. We pray for healing of our broken world. May your blessing be upon us all this coming week. Amen. Who will as 
now may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen.